Read from where we stopped the last time, uh, from verse 16. And when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered up the prisoners to the Praetorian prefect, but Paul was allowed to remain by himself with the soldier who kept him. And it came to pass after three days that he, Paul, called together those who were the chief of the Jews, and when they had come together, he said to them, Brethren, so here he's speaking to Jewish brethren, not Christian brethren, I have done nothing against the people or the customs of our forefathers, have been delivered a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who, having examined me, were minded to let me go, because there was nothing worthy of death in me. But the Jews, speaking against it, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, not as having anything to accuse my nation of. For this cause, therefore, I have called you to me to see and to speak to you, for on account of the hope of Israel, I have this chain about me. And they said to him, For our part we have neither received letters from Judea concerning thee, nor has any one of the brethren who has arrived reported or said anything evil concerning thee. But we beg to hear of thee what thou thinkest. For as concerning this sect it is known to us that it is everywhere spoken against. And having appointed him a day, many came to him to the lodging to whom to whom he expounded, testifying of the kingdom of God, and persuading them concerning Jesus, both from the law of Moses and the prophets, from early morning to evening. And some were persuaded or convinced of the things which were said, but some disbelieved. And being disagreed among themselves, they left. Paul, having spoken one word, well spoke the Holy Spirit through Isaiah the prophet to our fathers, saying, Go to this people and say, Hearing ye shall hear and not understand, and seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For the heart of this people has become fat, and they hear heavily with their ears, and they have closed their eyes, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. Be it known to you, therefore, that this salvation of God has been sent to the nations, they also will hear it. And he, having said this, the Jews went away, having great reasoning among themselves. And he, Paul, remained, or continued, two whole years in his own hired lodging, and received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God, and teaching the things concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, with all freedom, unhinderedly. So this is the last part of the book of Acts. But the ending is very remarkable, and I'll say a few words about this, because God works continuing. God's work is continuing, even Today, people get saved. So the book of Acts is really all about the Lord Jesus, as we have expressed in the hymn, whom we see now crowned with glory and honor, and whom we may praise, and whom we may represent here in this scene, where he is still rejected. That's our privilege, to represent our Savior and Lord here in this world. We see him crowned in glory, and here in this world we may represent him and honor him by representing him. But that... Uh, representation will be opposed and we have seen in the book of Acts it's Acts the Acts of the Lord Jesus in the glory it's also the Acts of the Apostles led by the Holy Spirit and therefore it's also the Acts of the Holy Spirit and we have seen the last time how Paul finally arrived in Rome the Lord had shown him and he had testified in Jerusalem he had been uh, taken and almost lynched by that multitude in Jerusalem and then the uh, Roman uh, officer came in and rescued him and so then there was a long story we saw Paul as a prisoner from chapter 21 to the end of chapter 28 we have many details of Paul as a prisoner 
and that is given for our instruction because it implies that God's testimony is under attack, not only that, also um, limited in a sense, but although it is limited, Paul in prison, the message could go on unhinderedly. So God's work may be opposed by all kinds of things, but God is continuing his work because after all, he is in control, not the enemy, God is in control. The Lord Jesus in the glory, what did he say? To me has been given all power, all authority in heaven and on earth. So he is really the one who is in control. And so that control we see in the book of Acts in a wonderful way. And that's a comfort for us also today to realize that despite all the things that are happening, the Lord is still in control and he continues his work. And so when the Lord told Paul in Jerusalem that as a prisoner he would have to testify for the Lord also in Rome, we have seen in all those chapters that there was a lot of opposition, a lot of difficulties, a lot of dangers. In the storm, chapter 27, and at the beginning of chapter 28, we have seen that other danger that he was bitten by, this, by that snake. But here he finally arrived in Rome. It says in verse 16, and when we came to Rome. It's like a solemn statement. Finally, we are there. And so we includes, as we have seen, Luke. It includes uh, others who traveled with Paul. And the um, prison guard, he committed the prisoners to the Praetorian uh, prefect. And so that is the head of the Praetorian guard in Rome. And they uh, watched over the, uh, over the prisoners. And so everything was kept in safety. And so Paul was also protected there by the Lord through this means. Uh, that nobody could attack him there. And so this... This is interesting how, the, the, how Paul was kept and preserved and protected. And last time I referred to Philippians 1, where Paul had said in his epistle to the Philippians that the Lord had used these difficult circumstances to further the gospel, to promote the gospel, because now he could reach people whom he would never have reached in his whole lifetime if he would not have become a prisoner. And so there we see God's overruling hand, and that's a comfort for us also, when God, uh, who is in control, as I said earlier, He changes sometimes the direction of our lives, but He is in control. And that's what Paul saw and accepted. He did not work against God, he went with God, even in these difficult circumstances. And even later, like about six years later, Paul would be again in Rome, in more, much more difficult circumstances, and then even then he accepted that from the Lord and he said, the Lord is with me. So Paul was always enjoying the presence of the Lord, even there in prison. Are we enjoying the presence of the Lord wherever we are, at home, at work, at school, on the job? There are so many situations where we need the Lord's presence. Are we enjoying his presence? That is the challenge. And so what we see then in verse... Um, 16, Paul was allowed, allowed to remain by himself. That means he had a hired a, uh, an apartment that he rented, and that means he had to pay for that apartment. We see that a bit later in the chapter. And that is why he also needed support, financial support. And that's why we see in the epistle uh, of the, to the Philippians that they'd helped him twice by sending support. And of course, he may have had other support also. And so here we see how Paul is preserved and in uh, relative liberty, although he has ch is changed there, he is uh, kept by a soldier who kept him, and that meant that he was chained. And so every four hours, the soldier uh, was chained. So six times four is 24. Yeah, six times f through the 24-hour period, the, the, the soldier changed and so many different soldiers have seen Paul there as a prisoner and they have heard how he was talking with the others like Luke and uh, Timothy and who was there for a while also and visitors who came they must have observed it and then some of those prisoners or excuse me some of those soldiers may have gotten another uh, task and be sent to the other 
uh, uh, corners of the Roman Empire. That happened. And so they would they got saved through Paul's ministry and then he would take the gospel wisdom wherever they were sent. It's amazing how God was able to use those difficult circumstances to spread the gospel. And we read a few verses about that the last time in Philippians chapter 1. And in chapter 4 of Philippians you can see that even uh, the gospel penetrated the house of Caesar. So that means the... Um, the, the palace where Caesar was with his servants, some of his servants and maybe also some of those soldiers who were working there uh, introduced the gospel there also in the house of Caesar and so this is how God's in control and that is written for our encouragement so that we will not be discouraged if there is a difficult situation but that we can see as, as a challenge as Paul did to see the Lord wants to use this difficulty to, to have the message promoted and also to help us, help me if I'm in a difficulty. And so we see Paul's zeal for the gospel because what happened um, in verse 17, it came to pass after three days. So the three days he settled in, he got his apartment ready and he didn't take a, a break. After three days already, and you can study the expression three days in scripture, is, uh, occurs many times. It has some significance, of course. And he called together those who were the chief of the Jews. You remember in this book we have seen to the Jews first and also to the Gentiles. That is the, uh, the method that Paul always followed. Always. Why was that? We have seen that several times because it's the chosen people of God. Although they have rejected the Messiah, they're still God's chosen people. And because of that, Paul uh, followed that rule, first to the Jew and then to the Gentiles. But in actual fact, we see, like in Luke's Gospel, when the Lord Jesus presented uh, to, to God in the temple, Simeon came and held the baby in his arms, and then he said that this baby would be a light to the Gentiles. He put the Gentiles first. And a light to the nation of Israel. Because that is the order how it goes in general. Like from the Jewish people there is a remnant that gets saved as we have here. But as a nation that is still future. That they will recognize the Lord as the light for their nation. Today he is still rejected by the nation. But there is a remnant always. And Paul belonged to that remnant. As we see here, as we see in Romans 11 and so on. And so he called them together. And as you have seen on the ship, Paul had this special authority. He is not a uh, commander. He was not forcing people. But he had moral authority, as we saw on the ship, on board ship. And here we see that moral authority. He invited them and they came. Um, in verse 17. And these were the chief of the Jews. And when they had come together, he said to them, brethren. So I repeat, this is a term that the Jews use. They called each other brethren. Just like Christians among us, we call each other brothers and sisters. Brethren is the plural. So they had the habit to call the Jewish, uh, the Jewish uh, compatriots uh, brethren. And that implies the sisters, but the sisters or the, the, the ladies were not here, of course. Here were all, only the Jewish leaders. And have done nothing against the people or the customs of our forefathers. So he was there, gives his testimony. He was there as a prisoner. So is he a criminal? No. He has n done nothing against uh, the people, that is the Jews, or against the customs of the forefathers. And yet... He has been delivered a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. And so he's going to explain why this happened and how this happened. The Romans checked him out in verse 18 and then they wanted to let him go. But then there was a protest, opposition on behalf of the Jewish leaders. You have seen it several times in the course of the book of Acts. And so he was kept a prisoner. And that was God's overruling hand. In a sense it was... Uh, unjust, he could have been released because they had no uh, no accusation against him the Romans, but they kept him to please the Jews but over this all is God's overruling hand, God overruled 
that Paul would be sent then as a prisoner so that here in Rome he would testify for the Lord Jesus there as a prisoner. And so there he is. In verse 18 he had to appeal. Verse 19, um, the Romans wanted to uh, let him go. The Jews protested against this, were speaking against it. This is a term that's used seven times in Luke's writings, in Luke and Acts. So that's a key word, speaking against. They are marked by the fact that they are speaking against, against saying people, we find that expression in. And that was in the Old Testament, it was in the days of uh, Stephen, we have seen in Acts 7, and that opposition continued. However, there's always a remnant, and we're we'll, we'll going to see that tonight also. There's always a remnant. But because of the new um, governor, Festus, who didn't know all the uh, ins and outs of the Jewish dealings, Paul had to appeal to Caesar uh, so that he would not be sent back to uh, Jerusalem. We have seen that in chapter uh, 24. But he, uh, he confirms here he had nothing against his own nation. He is not here accusing the Jews. Although they had mistreated him, he is not, has not any accusation. It reminds us of the Lord Jesus. He was mistreated and he never accused uh, those who oppressed him. And so Paul learned that from the Lord Jesus. And we have to learn that also from the Lord Jesus. If we are in a difficult situation, it's easy to blame this or that or this person or that person but instead of that he prayed for the oppressors we saw in Luke 23 and so Paul is also praying for his persecutors and he gives this testimony here he has nothing against his own nation although they had uh, done many things wrong and in other chapters we have seen he was not accusing the Romans either and so that is uh, an important theme to follow no accusations against the others but God had allowed him to be there as a prisoner and so that is the background verse 20 for this cause therefore I have called you to me he could not go to the synagogues he could not go and visit those uh, leaders so he had to invite them so that they could come and visit him and then hear about the situation and so why did he do that? At the end of verse 24, on account of the hope of Israel, I have this chain about me. So, we talked about the chain earlier. He was chained, the soldier, and he calls himself an ambassador in a chain. You can see that in other scriptures, he was an ambassador in a chain. That's a very strange ambassador. But although he was chained, he was a true ambassador. I mean, I, I'm sure if you would have listened to Paul, speaking to his soldiers, speaking to high placed people like and here these Jews, you would have been impressed how he could speak to other people. It's, he had a gift, amazing gift. And so what we see here um, that he was there on account of the hope of Israel. The hope is a theme that's very important in Paul's writings. The hope in connection with the church but also the hope in connection with Israel because as some teach that God has set aside Israel, that is true, but not definitely. God has set aside Israel for a time, temporarily, and not completely, because there is always a remnant. Paul belonged to that remnant, so God has set them aside, but not completely, and only temporary. temporary. That is important to understand this. And so, he is there because of the hope of Israel, because Israel will be restored, there is this hope, and that is connected with the Messiah. If they recognize the Messiah, then they have hope. If they don't recognize the Messiah who he is, then there is no hope. And so those who have uh, rejected him will fall into the hands of the Antichrist in soon coming days. And what he goes on to say then, in verse 21, they said to him, for our part, we have neither received letters from Judea concerning thee, nor has any one of the brethren who has arrived, reported, or said anything evil concerning thee. So they had no knowledge of what happened to Paul. And yet, uh, they were interested, of course, to know why he was here as a prisoner. And so in verse 22, they request him, We beg to hear of thee what thou thinkest. So they want to hear him out. For, and they add something to it, for as concerning this sect, and that is a reference to the believers 
taken out of the Jews and out of the Gentiles and together is one church as we have seen in the book of Acts but they are called a sect often that's happening because the enemy doesn't like that testimony because they are very suspect and, and they are not uh, well treated they are not honored they are considered to be a sect and it's still today true believers who really want to follow the Lord in the eyes of many people around they are seen as a sect as a school of opinion or whatever it is but what we see here um, in verse 22 they are still open they are still willing to listen to Paul, what Paul would have to say so that's good to see that openness they were uh, ready to listen to his arguments that's a good thing the, some people reject something right away to talk about in, intellectual design no, as a no-no they are not even willing to listen or other issues uh, it, you, you can't even talk about it you can't even present the facts but they were willing to listen to Paul's uh, uh, defense here if I say the word defense it's not that he was defending himself he was defending the cause of the master we see that all through Paul's ministry uh, seven times he had a, an, what I call an apology and defense of the faith and the last time was the eighth time in Second Timothy 4 and then the Lord himself stood with him so that he could defend the faith and so here uh, he starts to speak then no no not right away it says in verse 22 uh, that it, this sect is everywhere spoken against and we talked about that earlier and uh, Stephen had noticed that in Acts, 2, in Acts 7 that the Jewish people had always opposed what the testimony that came from God through the prophets or through the Lord Jesus and now here in verse 23 having appointed him a day so they set apart a day so that they could listen to him in verse 23 so they set a date that they would come and what we see there they came with many so here this first encounter was with a few leaders but when they had heard Paul they said we'll come and to listen to you to all these details and many came to him to the lodging so I don't know whether they gave him an extra room so that um, they could talk together I don't know sometimes you have in a house uh, a special room for guests I don't know how this was uh, worked out and so they came there and notice in verse 23 what it said there uh, to whom he expounded that's an important term in the King James it says uh, to whom yeah he expounded and so that literally means he set before them what he had to say it's like a deposit he made this is what I hold this is what I uh, uh, testify of this is it and so he put it before them that is the thought and um, of this word expounded um, it is not here the same as expounding uh, or defending the, the it's really to set it before them in details and at the same time testifying of the kingdom of God why is this? because the, kiss, the kingdom of God exists today but not in public display, not in glory, not in uh, public rule. That is future, that is in the millennium. But the kingdom of God uh, is here in this world today, by, represented by the believers who commit themselves to the Lord's uh, authority, to the Lord's interest. And so, even you see it in connection with baptism, if you are baptized, you are baptized to the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, in the name of the Lord. He is the authority. He is the one who is in charge in the kingdom of God. And as believers, we are therefore also in the kingdom of God, but in testimony. And that is why Paul is testifying of the kingdom of God. And perhaps another time I'll go with you through all those seven uh, passages that you have the kingdom of God in the book of Acts it's very interesting that shows how we have uh, a role as witnesses witnesses connected with the kingdom of God that means the rights of God the rights of the Lord Jesus to represent these here in this world where God is rejected where the Lord Jesus is rejected and where his people is rejected so in that sense it is testifying it's a testimony but then there's a third uh, verb used here 
persuading them. So he tried to convince them. So there was also an appeal to the conscience, not only an appeal to their intellect, it was also an appeal to the conscience and to the heart. Those who have hardened their heart, they would reject this message. But those who were willing to open their heart for this message and their mind, they were then convinced that this was the truth. Because this is the truth concerning Jesus. Who is Jesus? He is the Son of God. He is Yeshua HaMashiach. He is the, as we find in Matthew's Gospel, Emmanuel, God, Wizard's God. He is God blessed over all. But also, we see him as a man. You can't separate that. The humanity and the deity of the Lord Jesus is one person. And so he tried to convict them of this. Because what had happened, if you read John's Gospel, you see they, the Jews, and there's nothing to say negatively. It is just a fact. They rejected the claim that the Lord Jesus is the Son of God. They rejected the claim that He is the Messiah. In the beginning, the Lord gave many miracles, and it was very clear, very evident, that He indeed is the Messiah. And according to their own rules, they had a whole list of uh, uh, that they could check out if someone presents himself and he does these miracles, like le uh, heal a leper, uh, open the eyes of the blind, then that, that must be the Messiah, nobody else can do that. So they had those signs, and yet they rejected him. And so that is here now, uh, the point he tried to persuade them, that he is Jesus, he is the Son of God, he is the Messiah, and he showed that from the scriptures it's not just what was in his mind it was not only that it, it was true that Saul of Tarsus saw the Lord in the glory when he was on the way to Damascus and it changed his whole life but he bases his message on the scripture the law of Moses so Genesis to, to that Deuteronomy there are many references to the coming of the Lord in those five books but also the prophets and so, if you, we have seen throughout this book of Acts that Paul was always doing that, presenting Christ from the Scriptures, just like the Lord Jesus did himself to the disciples uh, from Emmaus. And that is still important for today. If we want to say something, it has to be from Scripture, and not um, our own ideas. We can also interpret the Scripture in self-will, but that's not the case here, of course. And so what was the result in verse 24? Some, some were persuaded. They were convinced of these things. God has always a remnant. There's always someone who will believe. So we should never be discouraged if the message is rejected. God will always have a remnant. Just as you have here. Some were persuaded. And that is why Paul kept going. He was one of that remnant. You read Romans 11 and you can see it in detail. And so he kept going. It, from a human perspective, that must have been discouraging. But from this perspective of the Lord, what a victory it was if one of these Jews would accept the claims of the Messiah and recognize that he is the Son of God. That was, it would be a tremendous victory. And it was not only one person, it was several persons who accepted this message. So that's, that is the positive side of verse 24. And it says some disbelieved that is always the case but then in verse 25 being disagreed among themselves they left Paul having spoken one more word so they were not they were arguing arguing among themselves excuse me for the slip of the tongue and then what does Paul say here well spoke the Holy Spirit through Isaiah the prophet to our fathers saying so he quotes Isaiah now, and that's a very uh, solemn statement in Isaiah, uh, especially in Isaiah uh, 6, where you have the glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord, and that's quoted in John 12, that, they, that Isaiah saw, who did he see? He saw the Lord Jesus, because the, the Lord Jesus is Jehovah. It's a mystery. And so in Isaiah 6, when Isaiah saw the glory of the Lord, in John 12, it said that he saw the Lord Jesus. It's the same. And so, but Paul quotes here now that although that is so obvious, it's the same person 
Jesus is Jehovah, Jehovah is Jesus. Of course, Jehovah is also the Father and the Holy Spirit. We'll come back to that in a moment. But it's uh, also true that Jehovah is Jesus because God has revealed himself through the person of the Lord Jesus. The Father, when he reveals himself, it is through and in the person of the Lord Jesus. And the Holy Spirit has worked through him and still works through him. There's a method of the Trinity. So it's very important to see, yes, here it is the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Father has testified, the Son has testified, and now today we're living the day of grace, but also the day of the Holy Spirit. Now it is the Holy Spirit who is testifying. And verse 26 says, Go to these people and say, Hearing you shall hear and not understand, and seeing you shall see and not perceive. This is a judgment of hardening. That is very sad. When people reject the truth, God sends in his government um, hardening. And that is very serious. We see that this Pharaoh, that is the prime example that Paul quotes in Romans, he hardened himself and then God hardened him, hardened his heart because he hardened himself. And so that is God's judgment. Yes, we are still living in a day of grace, but if you are convinced and yet you reject, you reject the message, that is very serious. And we can give some examples of that. Um, also in King Saul, King Saul, the first king in Israel, the king after their desire, he um, rebelled, he opposed God's thoughts, and he resisted God's thoughts and the Holy Spirit. And so this is very serious when someone hardens himself and then God will send an evil spirit. Not that God, the evil spirit comes from Satan, but God is in control. He overrules that then Satan will attack that person. So that would be a whole topic to uh, study in more detail. And so this quote from Isaiah implies God's governmental dealings. And then in verse 27, why? For the heart of these people has become fat. The matter of the heart, the heart is the matter, what should I say? The heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. If your heart is in order, then things will fall into place. But if your heart is hardened, then things cannot fall into place. And that is the point here. They have hardened their hearts. It has become fat. That's another description of this hardening. And I repeat, that's under God's government, God's dealings with them. And of course, Satan is there uh, to use this opportunity to have them under his control. This is how he had the Pharisees under his control, with some exceptions. He had the Sadducees under his control, with some exceptions. But this is how Satan wants to harden the mind of man. In first, in Second Corinthians 4, we see that Satan is the god of this age. It's very serious. The people fall into idolatry and they think, well, that's okay. They don't realize that they are under Satan's control by following this uh, kind of idolatry, whatever it is. There's many forms of idolatry. But it is Satan's control. He is the ruler of this world and the god of this age. And that's what we find here. And they have closed their eyes. They are still responsible for themselves. You cannot blame Satan. They were responsible. They hardened their heart. And they closed their eyes. So that is a mystery that I cannot explain to you how man's responsibility and God's sovereignty somehow they work together and if man in his responsibility rejects God's message God may allow this evil influence or this control by Satan in his government. And the result is that they will not see and that they will not hear although they have eyes they don't uh, uh, see although they have ears they don't hear and don't understand with the heart. Because if the message sinks to the heart, you see, you the ears, you see it, and then it goes down to the heart. But if it's, the heart is hardened or fat, it doesn't penetrate the heart. And so that's the point here. If that is the case, they will not be converted. They will not change their mind. Conclusion in verse 28, Be it known to you, therefore, that this salvation... So that is the summary of what Paul is saying here. He calls it the salvation of God. This salvation of God. That's a beautiful expression. God is the Savior God. 
and his message is a message of salvation. And did you know that the, the day you are saved, God's at work in tremendous power to catch you from the claws of the enemy. It's tremendous um, work of God to deliver a soul from the clutches of the enemy, from the clutches of evil. And as uh, young children, you don't realize that. When you get older, then you realize how dangerous this world is and how powerful the enemy is. But there's one more powerful, and that is this God, the God of salvation. He can save people from these clutches, from these bonds. And now when they had heard this, they were not agreeing. We saw that earlier. They were reasoning. And now this chapter concludes. We will conclude with that tonight. Um, Paul kept on going. It was for two years. Now, why, why was it for two years? Because the rules, the, the Romans had a rule. If someone is accused, but the accusers don't come up to present their accusations, the prison is released after two years. No accusation, no judgment, thus he is released. That's what happened. And so Paul here remained two years till that period was completed, and so the Romans just let him go. And then we see in the scriptures that he traveled uh, to Crete, he wrote uh, letters, uh, Timothy, Titus, um, and he probably went to Spain and even further uh, northern Europe, but we don't have facts, details about that. But he traveled a lot. And then um, about four or five, like five years after this release, he got imprisoned a second time. That was in, uh, in present-day Turkey. And then he was uh, transported to Rome, and then he was thrown into a, a, a very difficult situation in a dungeon. And there he was uh, suffering of the cold and so on. And so there he writes the second epistle to Timothy. So now, what is Paul doing here? To conclude with this, it's so beautiful to see that how he used that time. He didn't okay, oh, I have to wait two years, so let's wait. No, what did he do? He opened the door, as we saw that earlier already, for the Jewish people who want to come. And during those two years, in his hired lodging, we talked about that earlier, that he had to pay, he had to pay himself the rent for that lodging as a prisoner. And he see we see then. Uh, he received all who came to him. In that time, he had, for example, Philem from a Philemon's servant uh, who ran away, Onesimus. He went to see Paul there in prison, and he got saved. That's one example. So Paul received or welcomed all who came to him. Whether they were saved, many were saved who came, or unsaved, like uh, this slave of uh, uh, Philemon, Onesimus, they were all welcomed, received by him. And what did he do next? Preaching the kingdom of God. That's the seventh reference in this book, of the kingdom of God. And we talked about that a little bit earlier. And so that is, he proclaims the rights of the king. Who is the king? God is the king. But the Lord Jesus is also the king. It's not a contradiction, it's both true. And there are expressions, today you have the kingdom of God and of Jesus Christ, in Ephesians 5, for example. So that is an important theme for us, to recognize the rights of God, the rights of the Lord Jesus, in a world where these rights are rejected and despised. So there's a challenge for us too, to recognize the rights of the Lord Jesus, and that's the preaching. The preaching is here... Uh, a public proclamation. This is the proclamation that Paul made about the rights of the Lord Jesus in a world where he is still rejected. And furthermore, he is teaching the things concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. So he is presenting, proclaiming the rights of the Lord Jesus, but then he is also teaching in more detail the things concerning the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he is Lord, that implies also that he is curious, Jehovah. It also implies... Uh, how he was here on earth, Jesus. It also implies who is now in the glory. Christ means the anointed in the glory. He was anointed here on earth, but God anointed him in glory. Acts 2, we have seen that. Lord and Christ. And so he presented these things, these teachings to those who wanted to listen. And that's why I said earlier, it would have been nice to listen to what Paul had to say. 
but we have the rest of the New Testament, we have the whole Word of, word of God, and so we can examine these things ourselves and learn uh, about this teaching in more detail. But how wonderful, concerning a person, or concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul did not bring a new philosophy, he did not bring a new doctrine, although that was true in a sense, but he presented a person and he was teaching the things concerning that wonderful person. You cannot have too high an impression of the greatness of the Lord Jesus. From Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, this is what we need also today, teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. And how could Paul do that? With all liberty. Well, was he not a prisoner? Yeah, he was a prisoner. But that did not stop him from this ministry. He kept going, despite those limitations. What a challenge that is, what an encouragement for us also, to keep on going. And the key word of this whole book is the last word. In my English translation it says, unhinderedly. That's an old word, but it means, no one was able to stop him. Yes, he was a prisoner. The enemy wanted to stop him. But God is in control, and God did not allow that Paul would be stopped. His mouth was not stopped. Only so many years later, when he was executed uh, in, in Rome, the second imprisonment, then God, the time had come that God allowed him to be killed. But not before that. And so in the meantime, Paul keeps on going, and the Lord opens doors, leads... And that is the liberty that you find in this book. It's not a man-made liberty, it's a God-given liberty. It implies that God is in control. And that is the encouragement for us today. The Lord's in control, our God's in control, and that is why we need to be subject to Him. Not introduce our own thinking or our own will, but really submit to Him, as Paul did. So if there are questions left, uh, I don't know how... The time is, but we have still some minutes, I guess, for questions or comments. This prophecy from Isaiah is very interesting in the fact that the Israelites reject, rejected Christ as the light of the world, and this is why they walked in darkness. Mm -hmm. This is why they tripped, they stumbled, and they stumbled over him. What um, reference? In Isaiah 6, you mean? Yes. Yeah. And God made him the chief cornerstone. So this is what is so interesting here. God gave them a chance, but they rejected the chance. Yeah. And repeatedly, repeatedly, that's very solemn. And then God sends this spirit of hardening. And yet, even then, people can get saved. Like Saul of Tarsus, even then, he had hardened himself, and yet there was grace for him, because he did it in ignorance. And that's why we always say, it's never too late. The door of grace is always open, so even if a person has rejected the message, there's always the possibility that he can change his mind and come to the Savior, as we sometimes sing in a hymn. Do you have other thoughts about that, Frank? No. I was just thinking about the fact that the Gospel of John has a lot of this in it, and like you mentioned, this is mentioned in John 12, yeah. but the Gospel of John also has seven signs. They're yeah. not called miracles, they're called signs yeah. which show that he was the Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah they had been waiting for, and this they rejected time after time again, and he asked, they asked him plainly, are you the Christ? He told them, yes I am, and they still rejected it. But that is why it's so important to see the conclusion of John's Gospel. John's Gospel has two conclusions. One, at the end of chapter 20, these are written, in verse 31, that ye may believe that Jesus is the Christ. That means He is the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Son of God. And as I said earlier, these were the two things that the Jewish leaders rejected rejected always but if you believe you have life in his name so that is the two options because the kingdom of God connected from the Old Testament 
Mm -hmm. Is it part of the progressive revelation? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> because the Lord himself is the king. You see that in Jeremiah. But um, he has delegated the authority to the Lord Jesus. God has delegated the authority to rule to a man. First God gave it to Adam, but Adam failed. And then God said, I wait, what's going on? And after 4,000 years, he sent the Messiah. And when the Lord Jesus was born, what did the wise men say? They were looking for the king that was born. The king was born, a baby in a manger. He was the king. So he represented God, who is the king, and he would be, as a man, the king as well. And that is, that is the mystery of his person. He's God and man in one person. So he goes with this, and so if you uh, if you think that's okay, the next time we could go through those passages one more time about the kingdom of God in the book of Acts, because that's very practical for us today. It's not in connection with one acceptance, it's connected with the future, but it's in connection with today, and so we'll explain it in a little bit more in more detail, if that's okay, Lord willing, at the beginning of April. <laughs>